going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. A month ago, about 70 people who are concerned with the challenge of homelessness in Cincinnati completed a report entitled Homeless, Homelessness to Homes, putting an end to homelessness. And on April the 15th, the report was made available to the public. Homeless to, Homelessness to Homes was it triggered by an ordinance passed by the Cincinnati City Council last October directing the Cincinnati Hamilton County Continuum of Care for the Homeless to quote immediately address the inadequacy of the current provision for services for single homeless individuals in the city of Cincinnati and to put in place a comprehensive plan to implement such services. The resulting 100 plus page report is filled with analysis and recommendations for dealing with this serious urban challenge. We will devote the entire program this morning to the implications of this report. To do that, I'm joined by four people. Kevin Finn is the Executive Director of the Cincinnati Hamilton County Continuum of Care for the Homeless. Roxanne Qualls is a member of the Cincinnati City Council. Pat Clifford is the Executive Director for the Drop-In Center in Over the Rhine. And Sergeant Steve Saunders is a Cincinnati police officer who serves as the Neighborhood Outreach Officer for District 1 that includes downtown and Over the Rhine and served as one of the people on the committee putting this report together. Welcome to everyone. And Roxanne, welcome back. You were just Thank here a couple you. of weeks ago. In fact, let's start out because I know you had a lot of interest in this and getting this initial ordinance. What uh, passed through uh, council? What was it that prompted this effort at this time? Why did, did council believe that it was time to address this issue? Well, two primary reasons. One is I think that it's very clear uh, that the that the problem in terms of how the community has addressed homelessness has been simmering for a long time. And, and I think that it's just come to uh, the surface and people realize that if we really are going to be serious about moving people from homelessness to homes to actually support self-sufficiency, to address the comprehensive range of services that are needed in order to become, for people to become contributing members of the community, then we can't continue to do it piecemeal. The second thing is, is that you know, there's been increasing conflict between communities and social service agencies and a lot, some of it from my perspective, you know, is there's legitimacy on both sides in terms of their perspectives. But this is a, an effort that also integrates looking at how do we actually provide these types of services, ensure that they're good neighbors within the community, ensure that the people who are in need of the services actually are getting them, and ultimately it's, um, and not to be used too trite of a phrase, it's a win-win for both the community and the individuals. Okay. Kevin, um this report and the continuum of care oversaw the execution, the development of this report as I understand it. Yes. How would you characterize this report as, you know, is there anything different, anything unique, any, any sort of way that you were approaching the issues that are involved here in a fresh way so that uh, the results turn out to be really different? What the Continuum of Care normally does is coordinate services, but particularly in line with federal dollars that are made available to our community for those services. But to some extent, um, as Ms. Qualls mentioned, it, it's a little bit piecemeal in terms of the different funding sources are each handled slightly differently. What this effort gave us the opportunity to do was take a coordinated effort to look at all the resources that are currently funding our homeless system and bring them all into consideration at the same time and how to best use those resources. Um, also, it was very much a community-based process with, as you mentioned, 70 people participating, seven different subcommittees, also a steering committee that were overseeing the larger process. Were the opinions of homeless people themselves somehow solicited and factored into this? We did have several homeless people who participated in some of the subcommittees. We also did two what we call homeless think tanks where we 
had one that was a group of homeless men, one that was a group of homeless women. I think there were 20 women at the first, at the women's think tank and about 60 men at the men's think tank where we picked their brains about ideas that we should have, ran ideas past them that had already come up in the process at that point to see what they thought. Yeah, I want to say that there's a tremendous amount of data that is in this report that I have never seen it pulled together in this way before. And, but it also then is balanced out by the fact that lots of people's views were worked into this, including the homeless themselves, which I think is, well, makes this really interesting. If I may, one of the things that's unique is that Cincinnati and Hamilton County is the only community in the nation that has all of our homeless service agencies on the same database. Our ability to pull data on who makes up our homeless population stems from that advantage that we have. And that was a tremendous insight for me reading this, just to be able to see that kind of dynamic. Uh, Sergeant Saunders, uh, Steve, we, we do, we're pretty casual here. Okay. Um, why a police officer involved in this? And you were, you actually headed one of the committees. That's correct. Why were you involved and why is this important to not just you as an individual, but to police officers? Well, we, we deal with challenges with dealing with the homeless population on a daily basis. Well, there's uh, people who are living in encampments on public property, uh, sometimes underneath overpasses or bridges, uh, to uh, panhandling issues, sometimes aggressive or what we call improper solicitation issues uh, downtown. And, and our involvement was uh, based on our involvement with the homeless outreach group that we meet on a monthly basis. And they, Kevin came to us and said, because you're already involved, uh, would you be able to sit on this committee and specifically focus on the uh, homeless outreach and safe haven concept that was, was uh, being looked at for this uh, process. Uh, so the reason police are involved is because we have so much interaction on a daily basis uh, with this population. They are sometimes a challenge for us to deal with as they are for a lot of the agencies out there and we wanna be involved from the beginning in the process with serving them better. I want to make clear, and this has come up in other situations, we did a show not too long ago on uh, the program run by Cincinnati Union Bethel off the streets, right. also talking about the role of the police. Sometimes I think people have the image that police are only out there enforcing the law, looking right. for people who are breaking the law, but in fact, you're on the streets, your officers are on the streets all the time. You're dealing with people in a much more complex sort of way. Absolutely, Dan. We have to look at people um, from a much broader perspective that if they're breaking the law, you know, obviously arresting someone is one option. And you know, with the limitations that we have sometimes with the, just, the justice system and even the, the space currently in, in the uh, Justice Center, we have to tackle those issues in a much more creative way. We have to think outside the normal parameters of just locking people up to, to address the problem. We have to look at alternative solutions, look at the available options that are out there in the community, and, and really get a, a more uh, comprehensive approach in dealing with these issues. Pat, you've probably spent, as far as I know, your entire adult career mm -hmm. in this issue. What's your reaction, your overall reaction to this report? Is this speaking about the homeless issue in a way that we have not? Is this framing it in a way so that we can move forward differently than we've dealt with it in the past? Right, my reaction is, uh, you know, finally we're kind of pulling it together into a holistic framework. I think, you know, I've been involved, you know, for about 20 years right. uh, running the Drop It Center, which is the kind of community response for people coming in off the street. Uh, we do very well bringing in people, you know, from under the bridges and the overpasses and whatnot. And our, our city is actually one has one of the lowest percentages of unsheltered homeless in the country. Mm -hmm. That's good. We should keep that. But what we need to also focus on is looking at other cities, other models, using our own data to say, how can we go the next step once we have them indoors? Now, how do we move them into their own homes? And so looking at models that increase case management, that treat people in a more uh, a specific manner, uh, taking their individual needs into account, that's where we need to go. I mean, the drop-in center started out with many other shelters, uh, it's similar to shelters across the country, where it was an emergency response to an emergency situation. And, uh, you know, some cities you were continuing to operate that way, you have to operate that way. I mean, look at the economy. We, we had a 16% increase in shelter nights last year. You know, we're still responding to an emergency situation in some ways. but. You know, what excites me about working in this whole field is how do we move beyond that? Okay. And I, I think along with that, if I can, I, mean, I think some members of council in supporting the ordinance, I think thought that we were specifically looking at shelter 
and services in shelters. But like Pat was saying, really we have to look at the whole system. So a lot of what is in the plan talks about people who are on the street who have not even stepped into a shelter and there's a, a lot of specific ideas around transitional housing and permanent housing because clearly part of the answer is giving people a place to go from shelter, a place to move on and to. And we're going to get to that, to the transitional mm -hmm. and the permanent housing here. But let's take a look at some of this sort of immediate. And there are lots of sections of this report dealing with different populations. And we're just going to focus on a couple here uh, this morning. But let's take a look at uh, single homeless men. One of the interesting things I found here from 2005-2006 with data that Kevin was mentioning that you have access to, about 3,224 different individuals who were identified as homeless in that year period. That's across two calendar years, but it's basically a 12-month reporting period. By 2007-2008, it's down to 2746. Now, uh, Pat, you just mentioned that maybe because of the economic situation, that may be going up. But if the numbers tend to go down, the increase in the number of chronically homeless Mm -hmm. is proportionately, the absolute number and proportionally is going up. So let's go to the next one too. I, I want to see the, the, the next full screen and then we will uh, take a look. This is also to recognize that a lot of these single homeless men face some pretty significant special needs. Alcohol abuse, 63%, drug abuse, mental illness, or some combination of those three uh, is, is put together. And, and so this is a tough population. This is a population, but there is indication that, from that first graphic, that there's been some improvement. So, um, Roxanne, what do you take, you know, from where, what you see in terms of the trends here in Cincinnati about this population of homeless? Well, a couple things. One I think is really important to reiterate what Kevin was saying earlier, which is that, you know, Cincinnati, thanks to the continuum of care, actually is a model at this point in terms of coordination of services, collection of data, that providing the foundation to actually understand the situation. So I think. In, so that's one thing that's important to not acknowledge. The second thing is, is that the programs that are created that actually seek to bring people off the streets to try to coordinate services, I think um, that coordination of those services has improved. However, what we recognize is that if you're dealing with chronically homeless, you have to deal with substance abuse issues, you have to deal with mental illness. And one of the reasons why City Council passed the ordinance was recognizing that we have not been doing it as well as we could given the resources that actually are available in this community and are supposed to be directed towards helping people with substance abuse and mental illness. And so this report actually uh, in the calls for coordination, the coordination of the funders and also uh, acknowledging that the truth of the matter is is that in many instances it's not a matter of more resources but a better application of resources and coordination is really significant. One thing I think is clear here is it's not just shelter. It's not just right. physical shelter. Right. It's also, and Kevin and Roxanne both were uh, referencing this, it's also what you're able to do with people once they enter the shelter, right? Right. Yeah. Well, the, the, the solution to homelessness is housing. And for uh, most people who come into the drop-in center, a temporary stay, some case management, some assistance along the way, that is a success for them. But there is a, a, a smaller percentage that are the long-term chronically homeless uh, where you do need more of a wraparound and you do need a specific type of housing. If you, if you want to have them be successful in housing, just merely being in housing is not enough. You need that support that's there, often on site. Okay. And so creation of this uh, support, what they call permanent supportive housing and we will, for that population. And we're going to get to that but in the second half. I'd like to take a look at one last element, uh, one last graphic here, and that is a single men, uh, the recommendations in the re of the report in this area. And uh, better address of substance abuse and mental illness. So that's, Pat, what you were referring to mm -hmm. for. This is where it gets interesting. Three 50-bed general shelters, one of them faith-based, uh, City Mission right now serves that, 
uh, and services with focused, uh, ser uh, focused services. So that's what we were talking about. These three 50-bed general shelters. Kevin, what can you tell? Because I think that's different than what we're used to right now. Am I correct? This is, this is a different model. It, it is different, but the, the one thing that was not included in your graphic is a recognition that there will always be some people that perhaps due to their substance abuse or mental illness are not willing to engage in any services. So the plan also includes one 40-bed facility for people who just are not at a place where they are ready to engage in services. They just need to get in out of the elements. They just need a safe place right. to stay and we should give it to them. Um, now for people who are willing to be working with shelter staff to have a case plan that they are working on, they would then step up into these other facilities where they would be provided the case management, they would be working the plan. Those 50 general shelters are a part of that structure that people would step up to. The plan includes a recommendation that one of those facilities be close to the safe shelter, which is what we're calling that 40-bed facility, um, or adjacent to, I think is the actual yes. word. But the expectation is that um, the City Gospel Mission, which is currently functioning in a capacity to do that at 50 beds, would continue to do so. Um, but our task was to take a blank slate approach, so we weren't really naming names as to who was going to fit into what pigeonhole kind of thing, but there is some expectation there that current service providers would fill in on those gaps, but that there might also be new organizations that would come to the table to meet those needs as well. Okay, I need to take a break, but clearly there's a lot of questions even on this. We'll come right back. So stay tuned. After the break, we'll pick up this point and then move on to questions including funding. Welcome back. We're spending the entire morning talking about Homelessness to Homes, a new report that has just been issued about the, the challenge of homelessness. We just ended the last um, segment talking about the proposal to have the smaller 50 bed uh, units for housing. Um, Pat, this is not the model of the drop-in center. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction to this? What, what do you think about well, this? Well, at the drop-in center, we've been looking um, nationwide at other cities, how they've dealt with this issue. Every major city, like Cincinnati, has a large downtown shelter. There a variety of ways to organize. Um, well, I haven't seen the 50-bed model. I, I have seen shelters that have a variety of internal sub-communities that may be close to around 50 beds. So the, you, the, the main thing is that the resident has a smaller scale of mm -hmm. feel. Um, Rather than the big dormitory. treated like an individual yeah. and has an ability to move up, whether that be in the same facility or adjacent or in another, another facility. The idea that the person is treated individually given uh, uh, not one size fits all, mm -hmm. I, I really like that model. I think that's okay. what we should move to. So from your perspective, this is a model you're interested in exploring? Yeah, this is a, a systemic report okay. that kind of looks holistically at the situation. One of the things that, um, you know, I focused on a particular group, and as I mentioned, there are a lot of different groups, but Roxanne, there's other people, other elements of the homeless population that are also addressed in this. And um, in during the break, we were talking about this, and you were saying it was particularly important to call that to mind. Why? Well, I think because there's this stereotype, there's this myth as to who constitutes the homeless, and usually we think of that solely as single men. This directive of counsel to the continuum focused on single men and women, um, but we will first have to acknowledge that there are homeless families, and right. that was not the intent of this report, but within the report, um, the intent was to focus on single, single men, single women, and so there are recommendations for a shelter for single women, homeless women, and also a recommendation for a special shelter for youth who are homeless who should not be in adult populations. And I think for the first time we're really looking at this, as Pat is saying, much more holistically and much more 
uh, in touch with the reality that we actually see out there uh, on the streets and in the current shelters. I actually, in relationship to the question about women, found a very interesting sentence on page eight, and I'm not even sure who to direct this to, um, but it says, the recommendation is the creation of a permanent group home for, quote, the eight single homeless women who have <laughs> been long-term shelter residents. I mean, are we talking about eight individuals we can identify? Yes. Yes, um, we are. Th there are some individuals that have been staying at the drop-in center for a long time, and um, um, their situation is such that to disrupt where they're at now without another adequate substitute would be real de uh, devastating to their lives. They, they, they seek the drop-in center for its community in addition to just the shelter bed. They, they feel they own the place, actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> but, 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 but trying to re-envision <laughs> another way that that could be dealt with, I think, is a healthy thing. Okay, so, uh, so we're down to, I mean, what I find interesting about this, that sort of concern gets into we're a big, very a, a big if, report if about If we this. could put those eight ladies in one facility together, we would free up eight emergency shelter beds 365 days yeah. a year. Steve, I want to move on to this area, and you've referenced it several times, of outreach to people who really don't want to come into any sort of shelter situation. Right. Why is that? Why, why would people not want to move in that direction? I think there's so many reasons. It's, it's not really simple. It's not a simple solution to say, you know, why one person won't go into shelter versus another. A lot of them stem from uh, just the independence of living homelessly in a homeless situation. They don't like the structure of uh, maybe a shelter. Uh, they even have some experiences, uh, some po possibly negative experiences with shelters or other uh, environments. So they choose to live on the street. They choose to live homeless. Uh, some other aspects of that might be this, they have mental illness and, and sometimes in severe cases uh, or severe addictions to drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. And those are not accepted in the shelter environment. So that forces them out on the street. The combination of the mental illness and the addiction is probably the most difficult population to serve. And we work with the homeless outreach group, like, as I said earlier, on a monthly basis to identify those most problematic, problematic people and uh, figure out alternative solutions to make sure they're in the system that Kevin spoke about earlier, to make sure they're engaged with services, who's, who's watching this person, who's caring for this person. And then our interaction with them as far as law enforcement goes is what kind of detriment are they posing to the community? Because some of these people, quite frankly, intimidate and, and, and frighten people right. because of their behaviors out on the street. So we and have to Kevin, deal with that. In terms of responding to this group, it's really getting people who can work with them out on the street, right? The, yes. Getting yeah. workers who go out to them rather than trying to pull them in, which they're not willing or frightened or whatever. We have three street outreach programs that are active in Cincinnati right now, uh, social service agencies. Um, that They make up the homeless outreach group that Steve was referring to. But what we do not have is a street outreach program that targets the chronically homeless, chronic substance abuser who is sleeping on the street. Uh, yeah. So there is a recommendation in the plan that we develop a program specifically to work on bringing those individuals either into shelter or take them straight into housing. Okay. I think to say that public safety is an issue uh, and a concern for us. Um, trying to target on the individuals who are throwing up the red flags. I know there are individuals that we see at Drop-It Center that, that we know are potential red flags. There's individuals that law enforcement knows about. How are we wrapping around those individuals with the appropriate plan and then having that housing that we could then place them in mm -hmm. um, is, is key if, if public safety is an issue. I am very short on time. But I want to deal with a couple of things very quickly. One is the section in the report that calls smart funding. It's not easy to deal with this shortly, but <laughs> in a general sort of way. Roxanne, what do you think about, especially given the fact of, of the squeeze we have with the economic situation, with the uh, city budget, with federal budget, what is, you know, here we got this great report, but are we going to be able to find the funding to do anything with it? Well, a couple things. One is there is a need to take another step, which is to establish a transition team to really prioritize the recommendations and to match the recommendations with funding streams. And so that is recognized by everybody, and, and I, it's my hope that council will 
pass another ordinance within the next couple of weeks or so that will ask the continuum to establish such a transition team. In terms of funding, the good news is, is with the economic stimulus, there are some funds coming into local communities that could be made available to help with the implementation of the recommendations. The other th uh, thing is a point I made earlier, which is that as the 70 people, and particularly the group that was concerned with funding, looked at the issue of funding, what they found is that it's not so much of a lack of resources as the actual aligning, streamlining, and focusing of resources. Well, unfortunately, I'm basically out of time. But this is a very large, very complex report, a great piece of work. If you're interested in reading it for yourself, you can go to the Continuum of Care's website, which is at www.cincinnaticoc.org. Thank, thank you to everyone who uh, was here this morning, uh, and thank you for your work. And as this thank continues you. to develop, we'll all have you back. And thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men shaping our community for the future. Remember, Tuesday, May the 5th, is an election day in Ohio. Be sure to check whether there is a school levy or a local issue on your ballot, and be sure to vote. Have a good week.